All right, time for another draft science video presentation and such. So, um, yeah, well, who knows what we'll get to. We'll get to a comment. We did get a comment. Uh, not terribly useful, but yeah, it's usually my attitude, unfortunately. Um, so, um, I think we'll start by explaining a couple of observations. You know, I do have these observations now and then. So I'll probably play eventually um, some crappy interview with some guy who talked a little bit about um, Emily and um, Einstein mostly. Um, and um, yeah, has coronavirus crap in it. So it's just, you know, <laughs> A mixture of subjects, which is kind of irritating. Anyway, where, you know, just all this glorification again of Einstein's theories as if they answered a whole bunch of questions and blah, 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 blah. So part of it was um, a conversation about Einstein's mistake, you know, where Einstein uh, created a cosmological constant to correct for um, what seemed like too much energy in the universe, I guess is a way of saying it. Sort of the reason why they invented dark energy and then they used Hubble to create more uh, crap. Um, reminds me, I also saw an old um, Schrodinger. Um, uh, it's an audio file, um, but very interesting, you know, just because um, he's now, you know, tied to so much um, wooey wave theory, and he was a real determinist, um, you know, very um, hard mechanical universe kind of guy, and it's just kind of funny that now he's been converted into um, part of this woo physics. But anyway, um, so I was thinking about this Einstein problem, and the, I have, as I've pointed out repeatedly, the real problem with bent space is it's, doesn't, it's not real energy. So by taking a whole piece of the universe out of the universe, I mean a whole, a factual event. I mean, there's a real event of what gravity's doing, okay? It's a real cause and effect. And you're not following the energy. So the whole idea is, is that bent space is in this one part of the universe where all of a sudden you don't follow the energy. Right, the whole kinetic energy formula is kind of related to this idea that the energy just keeps going, it just never stops, it just gets converted into one form of energy and then into another form of movement and then into another form of movement, it just keeps moving around. Except it can spend centuries, for example, inside of a sun, it can spend a million years just trying to get to the surface of the sun. You know, the energy can be in here, it takes a long, long time to get to the surface and finally out into the universe to cause effects. Um, <clears throat> so I would argue that the, what was missing from Einstein's theory, what, what made it fail in the sense that he had to create a, a constant and undo the constant and then recreate the constant and say, oh, I made a mistake of undoing my uh, what I did. And I mean, the whole thing is kind of convoluted. And as, again, it gets related to so many abstractions. So it's sort of like the kinetic energy formula in the sense that it's, it has a real history, but people don't pay, like people like Piro, don't care about the real history. They just care about some point where they made a rationalization, and therefore it's accepted because we've decided it's Newtonian. So that's another example where somebody is defending the, the, the MV squared, and they're saying it's Newton. I mean, it's just so irritating because I'm sure, I'm quite sure. I mean, I mean, you don't have to take my word for it, but I mean, I don't think there's any evidence Newton would like this at all to have him, his physics slandered with MV squared, the physics of his greatest opponent in life. I think that way he would find that really, really irritating. Um, but anyway. Uh, but that's this kind of stuff doesn't matter to anybody apparently. <laughs> you know, slandering the dead is just part of the fun of living, I guess. So anyway, um, so the problem with bent space is is that you have real energy, and <clears throat> you know I would argue that gravity is why things are hot. Okay, things get hot. The, the center of the the Earth is melted <clears throat> because of gravity. Gravity is the thing creating the pressure. Gravity's the thing creating the heat. 
because it is essentially forcing things to move this way and then forcing things to move opposed to that and then forcing things to move this way and opposed to that. There's all this, this tension of forces meeting forces. And that's why things get hot and then they radiate that heat into the universe. So the problem with Einstein's theory was he didn't count for this part, okay? <laughs> the going in wasn't accounted for and all he had was a bunch of things producing energy. So the sun and the earth and all these other planets and everything else was producing, it's all producing a temperature, okay? And there's no where did the temperature come from explanation. So there's no, <clears throat> oh, the sun gets radiated by this, the universe. The universe. All the other little stars are producing light and that goes into the sun, and then somehow the sun produces this intense, um, you know, out. So, so you have a tiny bit going in, and you have this gigantic amount coming out, and none of that makes any sense at all, really. <clears throat> and, um, you know, it just doesn't, it's theoretical, it just doesn't. So the whole problem with bent space is it's not real energy. So you can't trace it, you can't, you can't see where it went, and where it goes, the energy. Um, it just creates a little closed system where you pretend it isn't being created by real energy. So my argument would be, obviously, if you understand the universe to have a whole bunch of energy in it, the heat is in the universe, and it's in the form of little bits of momentum moving the speed of light. That's why gravity works at the speed of light, is because they're the little bits the same bits that make photons, <clears throat> the same bits that make, uh, you know, the plus bit and the minus bit of uh, charge. And um, so that's, <clears throat> that's the flow. The flow is, you know, the energy goes in, stays a little while, gets, and it gets actually consumed. Some percentage of it is actually consumed by the process of taking the big piece of matter and hitting it with a little piece of momentum and causing the big piece of matter to move slowly away, okay? And so the force moving the speed of light is essentially stuck, pushing, and by being stuck it loses energy uh, because it doesn't move as fast while it's pushing. And so that loss compensates and so blah blah blah, but that's the real mechanics of the universe and that, you know, Einstein's theory is pretty detrimental to getting the right answer um, because it does take energy out of the universe and that's why they have to figure out some excuse for why there's so much energy in stuff why it's so thermally uh, <coughs> hot and anyway so that's the whole invention of uh, dark energy all of that stuff is all based on the fact that they took one of the fundamental mechanisms happening in the universe and put it in a separate pile and says it's not made by real energy. It's not caused by real energy. It's caused by something else. Some slidey, bent, spacey thingy. <laughs> you know, and uh, that's just not the truth. It's not the right answer. I mean, and it can be understood to be the wrong answer through lots of reasoning, but this would be one of the ways you would reason through it to think, okay, well, why are we accepting this part of physics that's not really physics? There's no physical explanation for the bent space. And <clears throat> it does have characteristics that kind of give it away in the sense that it's moving the same speed as all the other forces. So why would it be some other thing besides a momentum-carrying force? It's just too stupid. But there's so many parts that are too stupid. I mean, the, they look at a photon, these physicists, and they say this thing doesn't have... It has momentum, right? It has P... But it doesn't have any mass. No, but it has no mass. I mean, it's just a silly thing to say. You can't have P without mass. Well, you can't see that, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, it's just, you know, so much of it is just crap. All right, so I'll clean the board and do one more thing. I hope that's what I'll do. All right, we seem to be back. Um, all right, so the other thing I was thinking about was um, these different... Uh, experiments you can do that you know create a result and you know it'd be just good to explain what's you know the real consequence so what you can do is you can you can hit something with a, a, a rubber ball versus a steel thing or something something that bounces something that doesn't bounce so we'll say uh, we'll say no bounce and bounce <laughs> okay 
Um, so this would be like a rubber ball. This would be some kind of hard ball. And you hit a piece of wood. And, you know, you let these things just swing into it with the same velocity. All right. And um, the piece of wood will fall down because of the, hitting it with the rubber ball. But it won't fall down when you hit it with the hard thing. And it's kind of obvious what's happening. They kind of explain it by saying, oh, yeah, there's an extra force. There's no extra force. It's just that you're applying the force different. So <clears throat> in the case of the hard metal ball, you end up just breaking the fibers on the surface of the wood. So you're losing some of your energy denting the wood, which is kind of obvious. You know, I mean, you can kind of obviously know that the energy comes in fast <clears throat> in localized and high pressure. And the high pressure breaks some fibers here. And so some of the energy is used up, making a dent in the wood. And therefore, the wood doesn't go this way as far because it used up energy deforming the surface. The rubber ball, on the other hand, deforms the rubber. So the rubber ball uh, compresses. And that means there's less pressure against the wood. But the pressure is going to be there for a longer period of time now. So this is another one of those kind of speed arguments. Force goes in fast, isn't very effective because wood's like an insulator. It's got, you know, it's very, it's not very good at transferring energy. Um, it's kind of famous for those kind of things. You know, being, you know, sound travels slow through wood uh, and poorly. But anyway, so by the ball compressing and then re expanding back to its regular condition by it having the capacity to absorb the pressure by changing its shape, okay, you know, flattening, and then reshaping. It means it's going to, it's, the energy goes in, takes a little while, the ball compresses, and then the ball uh, goes back to its normal condition like a spring. So the ball is essentially a spring, and now the spring can reload the pressure again. And so it's, sort of a reflection but the real point is is that the energy is going to be put in in little bits okay and by putting the energy in little bits instead of one big bit you're able to knock the wood over because you don't waste any of the ener energy re you know misshaping the wood breaking the fibers of the wood or any of that stuff you use all of the energy to cause it to tip over so, um, just throwing that in because they really don't provide explanations for those kind of things. All right, well, my eraser's down there, so I'll pause again. Right, it should be back. Um, all right, so another experiment for which I don't, um, I haven't really thought through all of it yet to figure out exactly, um, you know, what the, what the catch would be. So, but the idea is to do the Newton's cradle thing, but have a really hard mass you know, at the end of, say, you have five or six of the kinetic balls, and you have something so it's totally unmovable object, way too big, way too massive, uh, tied to a desk, you know, the whole thing, gigantic mass totally, which would be the same thing as hitting a steel, you know, you could just say you had a steel rod sticking out of uh, an immovable mass, and now you're going to swing one of the kinetic balls into it. Fact is, it's, it's going to reflect, you know, it's going to hit <clears throat> and it's going to, you know, reflect back up um, because somehow it's going to figure out that the energy is going to tr transmit and then it's going to push the ball back out. So the energy is going to be transferred just as it usually is from this ball to this ball and then this one to this one and then this one to this one and this one to this one. And then somehow it's going to know, this one says it's going to say, I'm rejecting the energy essentially because I can't move. So it's almost like as if the energy just can't get to the other surface and cause this surface to move. I mean, this is all happening between electrons, right? The pressure between the surface electrons on the atoms. And, um, you know, but the bottom line is, is then the energy goes back into this one and reflects it, and then back into this one and reflects it, and back into this one reflects it, reflects it, and then finally to this one and reflects it back out. So I just thought that was an e interesting catch to the system because somehow 
this information is communicated. Like this one knows not to leave right away. It doesn't instantly leave, right? It doesn't just hit and say, I'm leaving because I already know I can't move this. Somehow it has to be told that this won't go anywhere and that this won't go anywhere and that this can't, you know, that this one really can't leave. This one can't do what it normally would do with swing out here because I've stopped it. And somewhere <laughs> in this process that's communicated. Now, maybe it is that they're so close to each other that somehow the fact that this one's immovable is somehow known on this surface. And so it hits as if it was just a bunch of, as if it was just a piece of an extension of this, the object. It's just an extension of the object that hits. And it's just like hitting here and hitting here. There's no difference. You can't move the object, so it just reflects. Um, but I just that doesn't seem satisfactory, <laughs> you know, I, that it has to, you know, I think the information does have to be communicated to this object that it can't know ahead of time that all of these are connected to something too big to move. And um, so anyway, it's an interesting question. I'll ponder some more and see if I come up with some sort of grander explanation um, because it is kind of interesting that the energy just doesn't dissipate as heat or something you know it doesn't just get absorbed by big objects they actually either move or they don't move and if they don't move somehow this knows to bounce off um, because somehow it knows the difference between just you know the energy being in there being used and the energy not being usable that is it's it isn't going to be converted into heat and it's going to stay here and whether it's bouncing back and forth or what exactly it's doing inside the object is the interesting part now they say all this moves at the speed of sound so it does make some sense the sound in steel which is pretty fast um so yeah there's plenty of you know time for the information to go all the way to this wall say i can't move this wall so therefore it reflects back like a standing wave you could argue but again why apply why apply wave theory where you don't need to you know that's what physics does all the time which makes physics um stinky anyway um all right so that's enough oh sorry sorry about that sound uh my bad all right so i guess we'll read the comment and see where i go from there uh, yeah. Yeah, I think that's what I'm... all right. I appear to be back. All right, so context. <clears throat> so I just made a video of Emily D. Chatelet, uh, whatever, um, about the fact that this whole physics of the MV squared really doesn't have any rational grounding. It's just a few aberrant experiments, and it's just a few of them. You have to you have to like deliberately do the experiment to screw up the answer. It's not like the it's you know something wacky that's obvious beyond the fact of what gravity does so gravity is a real obvious one we all deal with it and so the fact that it has this aberration where to double the velocity uh, okay I you know if I want to make two things fall and I want to double the velocity I can't just go twice as high I have to go four times as high okay so I have to increase the height four times to double the velocity and the trick is is that's because in gravity when you're being accelerated by gravity the acceleration it gives you right by moving this far is you're going now your velocity could be 10 meters per second but the truth is you only traveled 5 meters in that first second so even though you're going 10 meters per second when you're done following that distance you only really traveled five. So if you measure it that way, you only went five meters per second. If I was to measure your velocity, that's what it would measure, but that's not really what it is. Your velocity now is 10 meters per second, even though you only move five, right? So your acceleration is half the rate of the velocity it gives you. And so that's why you have to go much higher because the velocity takes time to increase it. You can't increase it without having distance to do it in. It takes time to gain the acceleration because you have to fall a certain distance to gain it, right? And so if you're falling fast, you're moving faster, that means you're running out of space. 
to double the velocity. I can't double the velocity if I'm only accelerating at five meters per that is I'm only gaining five meters per second. So it's that kind of thing. So there's an explanation is the point. You can understand why gravity does what it does and um, you don't fall for some notion that the object has four times the energy because it fell four times the distance. Well, it doesn't have four times the energy. It only has twice the energy because all it did was double its velocity. It didn't quadruple its velocity. And the other part of it is you're only changing one half of really what you're really measuring is its momentum. And you're leaving the mass constant, so the velocity has to do all the changing. You know, because you're not changing the mass to double the velocity. It wouldn't help you anyway. <laughs> but anyway... Um, the fact is it all has to come out of your velocity. So that's the other part, another way of explaining it. Um, so anyway, that one experiment sits there as a glaring, oh, okay, that's, that's the squaring rule, right? Because to double the velocity, I had to quadruple the um, distance. So that means, therefore, um, mv squared. So that tells you mv squared, but you can understand that that doesn't really have anything to do with energy. All you did was double the velocity. You didn't, you didn't square anything. The final result, when it hits the ground, isn't going to be anything that was squared. So even though it traveled four times the distance, you didn't gain anything that's squared. There's no four times anything. So nothing at the impact is going to have, be evidence of four times as much. And the only way they could make it that way was to use clay. So they used clay to catch things and clay has a bias for speed. So clay allowed things to go deeper in it if they're moving faster. So it would exaggerate the same way, you know, the inverse of the gravity, it has the same kind of inverse relationship. Now if they caught the objects with springs or something else, they'd see exactly the same momentum. You can't change, I mean you'd see a twice as much energy in the sense that you have twice as much momentum. Um, you doubled it, but you didn't quadruple it. So I'm just saying the reason why that. So that's what it's all based on, and this is you'd almost argue this is sort of trivial. Okay, that you know a grammar school classroom could explore these kind of questions and they could understand. Okay, these differences, and that clay they could understand something like yes, the clay allows a fast thing to get through it easier. Okay, because it actually conveys less of its energy. Um, you know, to the clay, and it, um, and so the slower thing, the slower it's moving, the more the clay sticks to it, the more the, the fingers of the clay can, you know, adhere, and um, cause friction, something like that. They could understand it with some analogy. So it isn't like this isn't any, anything near all the, you know, the very complex and abstract physics that's done, you know. Um, not a real challenge. This is checkers versus chess kind of physics. And it's very surprising that the failure of the physics is in this trivial checkers game. That somehow they can't even get the checkerboard part right. And yet they can do all this specialized abstract physics that's quite complicated um, successfully. You know, they can make a nuclear power plant that generally speaking works. Uh, you know, um, and that, but that's the, that you could argue is part of what um, specialization has done to science in general, is that people have become specialists, and so they're not even, they're not scrutinizing, they, you know, they don't have to do any general physics where they have to make it all make sense. The theoretical physicists were supposed to be doing that, but they've sort of all become specialists too, where, you know, they're, they're lost in their specialty of dark matter or some other kind of bullshit <laughs> and um, they really haven't they're not doing the big picture thing how does it all add up and what parts are in conflict and all of that they're not really um, a analyzing those questions because it, it's quite kind of obvious like I said this isn't there's been a few people you know who have written articles pointing out that um, this isn't very good science this MV squared and nobody's paid any attention um, I'm making what I think are pretty good arguments and no one's paying any attention. Um, and it seems that um, it's just not something physics has any interest, people interested in physics. 
seem to have no interest in exploring these basic fundamental questions of function um, and whether or not some of the assumptions in physics are wrong. It's just this one's so obviously wrong and so obviously trivially. It's the, the, the wrongness is trivial. It's as trivial <clears throat> as realizing that, yes, you must concede that there's different ways to measure energy and some ways are better than others at getting right answers. I mean, it's as trivial as accepting that simple fact. And once you've accepted that fact, then you can understand that, yes, if you're going to really truly measure something's energy, you have to use more than one experiment to demonstrate it. And um, <clears throat> you have to understand what the device you're using to measure it is capable of. You know, um, and, you know, it's that simple. So, you know, you use something reliable at measuring it under the circumstances you're attempting to measure. Um, <clears throat> it's, not, it's just it's not more complicated than that. In understanding the mechanics, uh, the limitations, let's put it that way, the limitations of the method you're using. All right, so with that context, um, <clears throat> matter Dirk. Um, could, you know, I don't know what that means. <laughs> you know, could also go further to say that bullet is spinning. Um, yes, you could. I mean, it's probably more important than the shape is the fact that it is spinning because the spin centralizes the gravity. I mean, centralizes the center of gravity. So the, the object has any imbalance in it. It'll be in less, it'll have less of an effect because the spin is essentially creating, uh, is essentially balancing its center of gravity. Um, <clears throat> as opposed to the older weapons where the bullet would bounce down the barrel. I don't know if it really bounced down the barrel. I don't know if that's really an issue, but it was really important how it came out of the barrel. So the, whatever the last thing is that influenced it could have a big influence. And so, therefore, um, you know, it was kind of important to make sure that you equalized all those influences by causing spin. Uh, the spring debate could have many variables, uh, but essentially there's always some energy being put out into the coil to compress it in the first place. Well, see, this is how you go through the process, and you say, well, yeah, but it's a tiny percentage, so that's what we can figure out that in a spring, a tiny percentage of the energy heats the spring. The spring gets a little bit hot, but it's not very much at all. No, it's not a lot of energy. Um, so they're pretty um, reliable. And the amount of energy, the amount of heat they create is usually proportional to the amount of pressure put on them. So um, it's not like it's got a huge bias for speed. Where the clay example, again, there's ways of understanding that the clay deforms, um, you know, a lot more uh, with the slower impact than the fast impact. That um, you can see it, the surface does different things when you're pushing the pressure in. With less pressure, you create more, you're more likely to go sideways, and all of that stuff can be it can actually be seen. You can video it. You can see it happening. Um, <clears throat> just as you can see the difference between applying pressure to a board to break it, um, where you apply the pressure slowly and where you apply the pressure quickly. Um, big difference. Uh, you change the period of time over which the pressure will be encountered, which means you increase the pressure, right? If you're shortening the amount of time the pressure can happen in, then you're also increasing the pressure. The, the pounds per square inch goes up as the duration, you know, is shortened. Anyway, um, all right, so, so in the first place, you know, you'd argue that these are, you know, there's stuff that matters and stuff that doesn't matter. So you can tell, like, say, with two magnets, like I said, it's a pretty consistent, you know, it's this inverse square law thing <clears throat> that the two repulsive little magnets, you know, well, now they're attracting, actually, that I can put them on the end of something, and I've created a, uh, still attracting, <laughs> these, are, these are tiny magnets, but they're really strong, they're really a pain in the ass to get apart. You have to almost hurt yourself. So, okay, they're repelling now. So the repelling force is, you know, 
is proportional. I mean, you push in, um, it gets stronger and stronger by a set rule, and there's very little to get hot, right? There's nothing, there's no real losses. So it's a very efficient spring. So I'm just saying we can know this. You know, we can know there's better and, and less good, you know, I could use this sponge as a spring, right? Because it has some elasticity, but it's going to be terribly inconsistent from, you know, and how wet it is, it's going to matter, you know? So it's not a very good way to measure, you know, in a scientific way. It's not going to give you very good answers. So we need to board while I have it here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Trying to have a better routine. Let's see, keep it in the bag. You know. Anyway, um, but it's still not terribly handy. Anyway, all right. So we'll go off to the next one. Uh, but then, how large is the spring? Uh, what's it made of? Right. Like, these are trivial questions, though. Right. This doesn't really have anything to do with. Once you, you know, you just test your spring, do a few experiments. Um, springs work. Okay. I mean, you know, we measure how heavy the fish is with the spring. We measure you measure how heavy you are at least it did until a few years ago and a spring was telling you the answer and it was telling you pretty reliable answers uh what is the projectile made of <clears throat> okay is the whole top area of the spring hitting the surface of the ball again you have to create a surface that can hit and then you have to account for the fact that well the surface can't be a piece of rubber Oh, the surface has to absorb the energy and put it right into the spring, so it has to be rigid and t tend not to be um, deformable. Um, you know, but those these are all the rules of doing an experiment. So you know, this isn't why there's an mv squared. Okay, I mean this isn't why. The reason there is is because scientists were corrupted by. Um, motivation to prove something rather than to prove the truth right they wanted they had an idea and they formed the evidence to support the idea and that's all that took place here it's not much more complicated than that and because the majority of people decided or the majority of the talking heads or the people that mattered um went for this for whatever dopey reason uh, because it provides for free will or some other kind of nonsense um that's why it exists. It doesn't. There's no good science here. There's none of these simple questions were even thought about because the objective was propaganda. The objective wasn't to say, "All right, I concede the you know there are some you know eighty percent let's just say of the experiments said one thing and twenty percent said something else." It's a tiny minority of the ex you have, again you have to look for it on purpose. Because most circumstances, it's totally understandable. Even the gun example is totally understandable. If I just start saying, let's, re let's reshape the stock of the gun so now that it's, you know, it's pointy. So I tear, put a, you know, I put a sharp point on the on the stock of the gun and I stick it under your chest. Well, you, now you start to get it. And then I say, well, let's start making the gun lighter, which means it's going to move even faster. And, and the recoil will be even faster. So the lighter the gun, the faster the recoil. You know. All right. <clears throat> then you get the idea that, yes, it really is bullet going one way and bullet going the other way. It's the same energy. It's not, it's not, like I said, this is almost juvenile. I mean, this is, grammar school kid could kind of understand if I start explaining how, look, if I make the gun lighter and lighter and lighter, it starts going faster and faster. The recoil is faster and faster and faster. Yeah. All right. Anyway, um, is the whole top area of the spring hitting the surface of the ball, or could a pin be used to force the energy into a small area on the ball? Yes. Yeah, so all things. Like I said, these are all <clears throat> obviously how you allow the energy to be transferred. But when you're transferring, it's almost like you want as much surface in contact as possible because that's going to make the transfer less likely to create deformation. So, you know, um, making the ball travel further. Is there a barrel holding the ball? Is it causing friction? So those are just too ambiguous to have any use. But obviously, anyone doing experiments on momentum would have to account for places where there are friction and there'll be losses. 
But like I say, the bowling example, you would say, well, what's the amount of losses to the alley? Even if the heavier ball is in, you know, is being slowed down because it's in friction is stealing a little more of its energy because of its weight. Um, it would be such a small amount that you wouldn't use that as an argument to say, um, you know, is sort of a funny argument in the sense that it's another thing against using the heavier bowling ball. And yet everybody uses the heavier ball. So in spite of the fact that the heavier ball will lose more of its energy to the alley, um, more of its momentum, um, they're still using it. You know, even though the eight pound ball is supposed to have twice as much energy by this theory. I'm just saying that this is such a glaring argument. I mean, it's so obvious that the eight pound ball doesn't have twice as much energy that everybody should just be able to agree. Okay, whatever, however they made the mistake, the fact is they've made a mistake because that formula doesn't make any sense. It doesn't predict the actual future. It doesn't predict the outcome. It's really bad at getting the outcome right. All right. Um, is there a barrel holding the balls? Is it causing friction? Is the theoretical experiment being done on Earth or in space? I mean, you know, I don't, I don't even know what the context of all this crap is. I, I like I said, the video was pretty much devoted to what happened 200 years ago and why they made this mistake and um, you know the fact that they could because there really wasn't any you know the, the science wasn't you know a collective enterprise it was a bunch of branches of it you know the French science versus the English science versus the German science you know, and there wasn't any, you know, communication wasn't perfect and, you know, everybody didn't have awareness of everything. There wasn't some, it has, they hadn't compiled a whole bunch of experiments. They haven't compiled a whole bunch of consequences and circumstances. So it wasn't a very open conversation. But like I said, now we can just point out simple things like, well, why do bigger wrecking balls work better? If small ones have twice as much energy, why are they using the big one? All right. Is there a barrel holding the ball? Is it causing friction? Is the theoretical, yeah, so it says, experiment being done on Earth and space. Yeah, so space makes it all much more interesting because, frankly, that's where all Newton's experiments essentially took place. Um, you know, most of what he talked about was in environments that were uh, frictionless. Anyway, the experiments need to be standardized is my point, I guess. So you don't know whether it's your point, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, that's just, you know, I don't know if there's much point in saying it's my point, I guess, you know. Um, and uh, what all that has to be standardized in the sense that all has to be agreed upon is the facts, the information, the experiments. So it's not so much that you can standardize them. The fact is, is they, we all have to have the same evidence on the evidence table. Um, you know, all the juries should be looking, all the jurors should be looking at the same evidence. And, um, you know, that should be some, and it should be unbiased view of the evidence. And I'm just saying, if these arguments were actually made, if this trial actually took place, there's no way that MV squared survives the trial. I mean, it's, it's going to be convicted as being retarded, uh, silly, nonsense completely undefensible as good physics because there's no good physics for it. It's all bad reasoning. It's bad experiments, bad reasoning, you know, bad interrogation, <laughs> you know, bad scrutiny. Um, just, it's really all, there's nothing, there's nothing to preserve it. Every part of it is hugely flawed. Even their derivative of, you know, Newton's formula. It's a perverse derivative where they end up right overtly end up multiplying the velocity times the velocity. I mean, they put the velocity twice in the equation, essentially. Say that force equals momentum, which has velocity in it, times a velocity. <laughs> you know, a figment velocity that they made up. So, they, I mean, they put it in there. They just hit it but they start right at the beginning of the derivation by saying somehow force equals velocity times velocity when it doesn't do that. Anyway, 
uh, the experiments need to be standardized, my point, I guess, or anyone can throw a variable in and claim something is incorrect. Well, every, anybody should be able to claim any, something's incorrect, and there should be the obvious. What we all should just sit there and say is, give me the reason why that's not true. I mean, you know, I could explain to you why UFOs wouldn't, you know, people can describe, oh, I saw a spaceship and it had a bunch of windows in it. And I could explain that it would be very improbable that aliens would use a transparency. You know, transparencies aren't likely to be stronger than opaque materials. And you really wouldn't go space traveling with glass windows or something, you know, with some weaker view screen. You'd have cameras, <laughs> you know. You'd have devices that were durable and expendable. You wouldn't do that. So, I mean, you can make arguments to explain why that can't be true. And that's what's missing here, is nobody's answering um, these critiques that I'm making, certainly. And um, they are wasting their time arguing with flat earthers who are just making preposterously silly arguments that have, you know, that have no credibility, that are clearly biased by a prejudice, clearly a distortion. Let me show you a an optical illusion photograph. I mean, a photograph that's obviously been created because of atmospheric conditions. <clears throat> and I'll show it and say that's proof of something. Um, you know, it's an obvious distortion of reality. Obvious quote mining. Obvious, um, you know, selecting of um, the aberrant and the illusionary aberrant, sort of like the ferro cell. Just show the ferro cell, little swirly lines. Look, the light's being bent. You know, when it can be easily explained that no, the light's not being bent. Uh, it's an optical illusion being created, okay, by the fact that the light is reflecting off little pieces of crap in certain directions. And, you know. So, um,. So I don't know what your bent is here. I don't know exactly what side you're arguing on. Um, I think there's a more than enough arguments and evidence, all right, I've, to to make the point. And you're you're you should be saying something. In my opinion, you should be saying something like, "It's obvious that there's not a good evidence trail here. That you know, you know the trial was a sham in the 1700s." and that they just kept um, doubling down on the, the, the nonsense declaration. They all decided it was true, and then once they decided it was true, they couldn't go back and say, oh, yeah, well, we made a mistake there. So they never had enough guts to fix it, so they just kept trying to defend it. They kept trying to rationalize it, and that's what every bit of evidence indicates. And right now they're showing all this resistance to accepting the simple argument, and it's really simple. The history is terrible. It's terrible science, and there's just not one single physical experiment that defends MV squared. Nobody has linked me to one. Nobody has shown me one. It's just indefensible rubbish. That's just the truth. And that's what you should be acknowledging, that there's a glaring deficiency in the evidence supporting this rather dramatic statement by physics that um, you know eight pound bowling balls have twice as much energy and it's it sounds like nonsense and the fact is when you look at the facts it is nonsense it's based on junk science really bad science really poorly performed science uh, really poorly argued physics um, yeah, really bad. <laughs> yeah, really. All right, so I don't think I'll bother playing the interview today. Um, I mean, the guy talking, you know, it's mostly Einstein stuff, and it's it's just, you know, it's so bad. I mean, just you know, even, you know, the little stuff they should be able to get. Like, like somehow, you know, oh, Einstein had an amicable separation from his wife. I mean, it's in the divorce papers. It's not something you could even... You could even, you could even have any illusion of of uh, you know, it being some fine thing, some some like it was not a, not a a brutally harsh process of abandonment of his family essentially, and how you know there's letters from his friends telling him hey, you just can't do it this way, you've got to fix this, 
you know, that it was that obviously um, cruel. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, and yet the historian says, no, everything's fine. Everything was fine. Yeah, they were good friends. <sighs> Amazing bullshit. But anyway, I mean, it's just such, it's so wrong, you know. <laughs> yeah. And uh, there was also, like I said, he was telling stories about the whole um, Voltaire, what's your face relationship that don't gel with other people's description. And yeah, that doesn't gel with what they overtly say in letters and things. You know, like I said, the letters are always a pretty good, that's a pretty good source, the private letters. You know, when they got some of that stuff. But anyway, it doesn't really. Uh, his his distortion of the actual physics is the real problem, and so that's the part I, you know, will probably wish to comment on. But anyway, all right, so that's enough. I'll just surrender. And um, so till the next time, when uh, you know, there's just there's zero rational feedback. I mean, useful feedback. Sorry, um, feel rational in a way. Um, <clears throat> connected to the this. What what I, when it's just a stark fact, okay, that there that physics has right in its core a silly formula. I mean, it's just silly. It's not like it's just you know not very good or you know just. But it's it's silly and it's fundamental. I mean, and then they'll call it Newtonian or classic physics when. It has nothing to do with any calculation Newton ever did. So everything that Newton was successful at doing, he was successful at doing by not using this formula. And yet they're claiming it's somehow fundamental to understanding how the universe works. And again, I'd argue it's as fundamental as understanding if I call gravity bent space, and it is in fact being made by energy, then I'm missing a whole part of the energy cycle of the universe. And, you know, that's rather a significant mistake to make. And they don't have any, they, there seems to be no appreciation for how they should get these things right. That having the wrong answer does matter. And they just keep pretending it doesn't. But anyway. Alright, so, till the next time and such and so forth and whatnot this way I guess. So this has been a draft science video presentation. Such.